Hey, Battletech fans, hopefully you can hear us. This is Talon Coleman, as usual, here with you for an AMA for the book that is coming out called Hour of the Wolf. We should be able to hear and see us now. Let us know when you guys can hear us, and if you can hear us okay. I'll let everyone here introduce themselves. You probably know a lot of them already, but I will still let them do that anyway. Uh, Blaine, why don't you go first? I'm Blaine Pardo. I'm an author. <laughs> <laughs> I surprised them all by keeping it short. Uh, Phil? I'm uh, uh, Phil Lee. I, uh, I'm the uh, managing editor of Shrapnel, the official Battletech magazine. And uh, I also edit, I write, I do lots of things. Aaron? I'm Aaron Kahl. I'm the Battletech assistant line developer. Uh, like Phil, I also edit write and uh, do other uh, communications uh, related tasks. All right, Brent, you're up. I am Brent Evans. I am the art director for Battletech, have been for 12 years now. And uh, I, I may have had something to do with the with orchestrating the, the events that we're about to discuss. <laughs> and I'm John Helfers, executive editor for the Shadowrun Battletech Alliance for Catalyst Game Labs. And co-conspirator with all these people. So, all right. Okay. Yes, uh, Aaron in his car because he is hunting for Pokemon. Okay. Maybe you're driving. So this is the AMA for Hour of the Wolf, the book that Talon accidentally said is already out. Thank you very much. That I, launched on January first. I'd say it was already to, out. You said you said was coming out in your intro. <laughs> I was like, dude, it's been out for a month and a half. Nah, not bad. <laughs> um, but we're here to talk about the creation of the book, and as as uh, Brent slyly hinted, as the events that led up to it and how our came about. The first, I think, real, I want to say, advancement was a plot in a decade ish. I mean, it's been a while. Let's be honest. It certainly so, feels like it. Mm, mm. <laughs> uh, and so, and we have questions uh, from the fans. Hope you guys have questions about how this came about, how we all managed to get our, our mechs pointed the same way and on the same page, et cetera, et cetera. So we can start about, I don't know, Brent, do you want to talk about kind of how sure. we got here? And then we'll kind of lead into it from there. Absolutely. So for those of you viewing from home, most of you know that in some way, shape, or form, the the story of Battletech, it hadn't written itself into a corner, per se. But we'd gotten to the point where it was time to fish or cut bait on the events around Ill Clan. I think Ill Clan, the book, was originally solicited, gosh, I want to say seven years ago? Eight years ago? <laughs> was it more, Aaron? At least. I mean, there were drafts going back to, yeah, 2012, 2013. Yeah, exactly. I, I think I had the first original cover of it done eight years ago. And I have it. I have the only printed book that was ever done of that one, which was entertaining. Uh, which is a preview for Gen Con. But anyway, we, you know, things happened, and and really the story was was hit with a one-two punch that in the real world the publishing industry as a whole was changing drastically. Uh, the way products were were packaged, the way they were designed, uh, how brick and mortars were handling uh, products going to to stores. It was in a painful point of evolving as as major bookstores went out of business. The business model kind of evolved. Distribution changed. So all all that's happening in the real world. In the story, it, part of it was that the creative team for BattleTech could not come to an agreement on how those events would take place. And it was it, it got to a point where some people seemed to be acting that they just simply would never. What what if we just never go there? What what if we just don't even bother to invade Terra? Will, will anybody notice? And of course. I pointed out everybody was going to notice. Well, about five years ago, Randall Ray and I embarked on a massive epic journey to uh, uh, enlist Anthony Scroggins in on redesigning the core mechs, you know, really pushing the core story forward, moving everything, and then overhauling the entire Battletech line to meet the product demands of brick and mortars and the market we're asking for in the current modern day, uh, instead of the way things were designed in the 80s and 90s. All of that came to a head of me making a clandestine call, en enlisting Blaine on a diabolical plot, 
to force the events of Ill Clan to happen so we could move through it and then move the storyline forward in Battletech into a new era. So that's how we got where we are. Pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah. Well, since, since he handed the ball off to Blaine, I'd be curious to uh, hear his kind of take on how this all came about. Well, it was somewhere around Barstow at the edge of the desert when the drugs began to take hold. <laughs> <laughs> I remember saying it looks like the air is full of swooping bats. No. Um <laughs> but uh no, it was uh you know, we started this. We had a meeting at Gen Con in 2017 to actually start laying out some of the foundational pieces of this. Um it was a lot of fun. It, you know, the the book has morphed quite a bit. I would say that there were some pressures that came up in the middle of doing this um yeah, we had the end of Game of Thrones took place, which was a disappointment for most people. Um, and we also had Avengers Endgame come out, which was a huge, you know, boon for most people. So it put a lot more pressure on the book itself. And we went through several rewrites of it to get where we are. Uh, some components, honestly, the core of the invasion itself really didn't change that much. Um what changed were some of the key scenes um, and and some of the focus on characters. Originally, and, and John, will, John will attest to this, we had 28 different perspectives of characters in the book. <laughs> and John ordered me to trim it down slightly, and I think we got it down to 12 or 13 it, but he kept saying, trim it down, but add a perspective for this. Trim it down, but add a perspective for this. Um, so it was a real challenge from that front. But I think it, overall, it, it was a lot of fun to do it. Um, it. It was neat to bring these things together. I honestly, personally, don't think that Hour of the Wolf really stands. It stands on its own, but I think you almost have to get through some of the prelude stuff to really get the full depth of what the story is. You, you need to start with Divided We Fall. Uh, icons of war rock of the republic you know you have to have some of that build up and some of that goes back to some of steve moen's work you know going back to bonfire worlds i i think if you get those kind of core components by the time you hit our the wolf it kind of brings a lot of story threads all together at least that's my perspective of it right and the interesting thing was for a long time, we weren't doing, we were barely doing any fiction at all. It was just kind of limping out there um, just because of a lot of constraints. Uh, one was different opinions. I think this goes back to what Grant said about the direction of where we were going to take the line and B, just the fact that my nascent publishing arm had little budget to do this kind of stuff. So, but once, and, and again, uh, I want to talk to Brent's uh, comment real quick about publishing it can change so quickly and the fact that embracing ebook and pod publishing meant that fiction now suddenly could get to press a lot faster and that really helped change how we started doing the program like this is why alas and no one's i'm not calling out anyone there's no one's fault but the ill clan book is coming out a few months after our um for those who are wondering i just uploaded with some minor minor typos like like superior <clears throat> I just uploaded a new version of the ebook for people. So if you if you refresh your Kindle or whatever platform you read it on, some of those minor typos have been corrected. Um, and thanks to everyone who puts those in Kindle in Amazon because it helps us make better books. Anyways, getting back to my point, when Brent brought was brought in to serve as acting line developer for uh, two years, uh, the first thing he called, or sorry, the first person he called was me and said, "Hey, we want to put fiction back front and center um, to start moving things forward toward this." eventual goal that we've been working for for well 30 years this is a 30 year plot line in place i think right yeah 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 and which excited me because it was a big sea change for the inner sphere and actually you know altering things we kind of i think been stuck in even with dark age we've kind of been in stasis for a while it's just things kind of not spinning wheels things were happening but it just wasn't really on a grand basis that battletech was known for um and then having blaine and uh, everyone here kind of joined together to get that meta plot figured out. Um, and then carving out uh, Blaine's 
first uh, one of his early drafts tried to cram everything from our and uh, divided we fall into one was it one book one massive manuscript that we yeah. had to kind of cut up which i think ultimately helped because it gave us a launching ramp into our of the wolf uh, hey john can yeah. we take a quick moment and talk about um because you hit on a really key thing that most of the fans don't know this product was developed in ways i've never seen another product ever developed like this the originally in, the original intent was to write the source book and the novel at the same time mm -hmm. unfortunately mm -hmm. that meant that any changes or evolutions that happened with any event in either product needed to be communicated to the other and the other is that originally all of the events of shattered uh shattered fortress the events of the invasion and all of the events are what's to follow in launching the next era were all supposed to be included in the same novel and the same source book it was so epic. There was no way to create it. It honestly would have been right. a 2000 page novel and the source book would have been bigger than a core book. Yes. So that's when, you know, many of the fans a couple years ago started seeing us cutting things apart, making them stand on their own. Uh, and huge credit to John here and the author team for Battletech, not just Blaine, but the whole author team for Battletech. Uh, one of the things the, when we brought that to them, when, when John and I, agreed fiction needs to drive the events of this this moment in Battletech history the authors were going to be the ones to, to really do the heavy lifting it wasn't going to be the source books and that was a significant change over the previous 10 years worth of releasing product so the first question that the authors uh, universally asked and Stackpole was the very first one he's like how many words do I get because they'd always been given an artificial limit on the story according to this is the how many words go in a novel well, John and I had recognized that the entire publishing of novels and fiction had evolved so drastically, we could accommodate anything. And for me to go back and tell, you know, I'll never forget the look on Michael Stackpole's face when I said, you write whatever you think is necessary to tell the story properly. I don't care how long it is. If it ends up becoming two books or three books or more, I don't think the fans are going to have a problem with that. And, and across the board, John's ability to what we call you know, uh, wrangling the cats when they've all been basically let off leash to run has been an epic thing. So when John says casually, oh, yeah, we had to cut some things apart. <laughs> it, just so we're clear, that's like the invasion of the Death Star epic level of an event. So back to John and his awesomeness. Well, thank you. Um, what, uh, the Ill Clan plot had a few versions with its current incarnation going against the published 30, uh, 3250 teasers. Um, or should we still approach those as a glimpse of things to come? Uh, actually, let's bring Ray in here, um, just a second. And, yeah, oh, let's no, throw no. him on that That's particular good. grenade. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right, hold on, hold on. Let me, here we go. I add, here we go, Gab. Okay, give me one second, and we have a line developer, Ray Arastia, that we're going to thwack over the head. And yep. there we go. We're going to add him. It might, might cause some rejiggering real quick, so give us just yeah, a bear with us. hot moment. <laughs> it, it's an excellent Brad, question. stop showing that. <laughs> <laughs> Put it down. The only time you'll ever see it, and now it's gone. <laughs> like a ghost. Okay. It I'm never gonna... happened, but it's on the internet. <laughs> we, we'll, we, we'll be talking. We'll also be hinting a little bit about what's to come. We have we have plans. Much much I say, much I, plans. I still have the original uh, Ill, Scran Ill Clan manuscripts. So. Oh yeah. And Ray, there's Ray. There's Ray. Hey Ray. Is hey, Ray. Apparently driving away from Ray, Ray's also in his car. I hit each other. <laughs> Some <laughs> county that has better internet connection. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So, Talon, do you want to hit that hit Ray with that question again? Because he just leaps into the chat here. Ray's our line developer for uh, Battletech. Yeah. Uh, hi, Ray. User asks, uh, we've heard that the Ill Clan plot has had a few versions. Will its current incarnation go against the published 3250 teasers, or should we still approach those as a glimpse of things to come? Those, That's a glimpse of things to come. There, There's no reason that we're not still heading in that direction, but people have assumed after reading Hour of the Wolf that it's a straight line from A to Z, and there's actually lots of interesting twists and turns just in the next few years. 
Okay, here we go. So, uh, what I wanted to give a, sh a real shout out to finish up my part, and then we can toss it back open to fan questions. Is uh, also, you know, Brent's absolutely right. The core author and editorial team we assembled for this was vital, and I could not have done this without the help of everybody. Uh, but the main grumpy old man who handled this was Blaine, uh, because he not only had the institutional knowledge to handle this, but also, along with Brent as his co-conspirator, had come up with kind of the main thrust of how we were going to get from A to B and take in all those parts, like Wolf Dragoons, like Wolf in Exile, like with the Falcons and where they were going. So, you know, and to be fair, telling that story on a big canvas was difficult, which is why we had to start chopping it up, as Brent said. And fortunately, again, given the advances in publishing, we could put out Divided We Fall as a separate uh, book, and it did very well. We could put out Brian Young's Otter's uh, Gauntlet and um, Craig Reed's Icons of War. And those all stood alone, but as part of the larger group, absolutely. And it does go back, I think, to Steve Mohan's excellent Bonfire of Worlds as kind of a reintroduction to here's where we are, here's where we're going. So... Absolutely, but it was it was absolutely a team effort. Um, another user asked, are we going to get more remakes soon, specifically the Ostrok, Ostol, Goliath, and Scorpion? I know it's not really yes. The Hour of the Wolf. <laughs> well, it depends by what you mean it by soon. But well, yes, they are, they are <laughs> Tech, you have to take a long view of things. Wait till we get wave two out, then we can start busting each other's chops over what comes next. <laughs> that is fair. That hey, is Ray, fair. I, uh, I think someone's got a lot of feedback coming in through right now. It sounds like either a car or a fan or something. Or is the fan? Any difference? Even in the car, it's a fan. That is better. Uh, yeah, it looks like it cleared up a bit. Yeah. All right. You know, I'm just going to put myself on mute. And I'll start. <laughs> Someone had mentioned about the Anorak. There was a question earlier that I thought the designers, or if Ray wanted to talk about that, about how that came about. I'm, I'm trying to look for the darn thing. Oh, here it is. Where did the idea for the Anorak come from? Now, right, that's, know... that's Brent. That's okay. Brent. That's Brent and I. We, we had to talk about that. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, so, yeah, honestly... We realized that uh, Alaric was going to compartmentalize the, his plans on how they were going to unfold. Part of it was, uh, you know, attacking Terra, and the part of it is defeating, defeating the Falcons and then holding Terra. So we realized that with the limitations that he would have in the Wolf Empire, he was going to have to dig dedicate resources specifically to tackling those individually instead of trying to come up with technology answers that would solve all of them at the same time. So the Amarok was absolutely a counter to the events that he knew would play out against the Jaded Falcons. He knew that after he intended to put down the Republic, his force would be it would be an all all a no holds barred battle against the Falcons. And because of the nuance of Malvina Hazen's combat doctrine, Death from Above had become such a massive part. And admittedly, part of it is that he wanted to ensure that he could um, deliver a symbolic counter to that. That absolutely showed the Falcons had swayed from the way of, of Kerensky and had gone the wrong way, and he was going to embarrass them. It was, in no uncertain terms, a way for Alaric to embarrass Malvina's battle tactic. Um, so, recognizing how many of the warriors in Malvina's current group uh, were... Wow, that's a crazy background. Whoa. What just, just freaked happened? freaked it all out. Talon, what'd you do? <laughs> anyway, um, so... Uh, uh, okay. When you come to counter, like, how do you counter a death from above from a Talon-equipped... 90 ton assault mech uh and it really that's ultimately that was the design question how do you solve that uh and that's what led us down the wild crazy train of, of developing the amaron uh john, yeah, I think did, you on, john did you I put th on a filter i didn't touch anything dude I i've been scrolling through looking for questions i'm not sure this is interesting because we all look like we're in like an outdoor amphitheater now <laughs> but i did i swear but, I, did, I touched nothing Really, oh, I Talon, the, 
the Grand Council. Except races okay, will disappear funny, for some strange but reason. It's yeah. funny. Make it go away. <laughs> but I can't make it go away. I don't know what <laughs> turned well, it at on. Least we're at least we're not all cats. So, you know, there you go. <laughs> uh, let's see. Well, uh, while Talon does tech support, I'm going to move on to some other questions of trying to play and get younger. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> Uh, question for the team. I'm, I'm just going to skim around, guys, so if you want to repost down below. How do we get... Yeah, oh, how do we... I'm sorry. How do we get the creation and path of events for what to expect for the new era Ill Clan rubber stamped? Collaborative amongst yourselves in consensus. Um, well, it is a consensus, sure. There's, there's no one... How to say this? There are voices that guide it, but it's a group collaboration thing. And, and Aaron, actually, I think I'm going to bring you in to talk a little bit about this and how these things are moving forward after Hour of the Wolf, because, you know, you're heavily involved in putting the new Eel Clan book together, so I'm going to toss this ball to you, I think. So, we've had a group meeting to really try and pin down a lot of this, because I think the first step in all that was understanding how much Hour changed. Uh, how much it changed in the universe, what it left in play, because, you know, early on, going back years, there's been the specter of a time jump, right? And, well, we we had no intention of doing that. But even if we wanted to, we could not. Because where our leaves things demands so many, asks so many questions and demands so many answers that for the next few years, that's what we're going to be focused on. The first... Uh, book is going to focus on um, the Falcon OZ. I don't think that's a secret. We've talked about that in another AMA. You know, what happens when an entire clan's military leaves, goes to Terra, and 95% of them die? There? What opportunities does that create in that area? What challenges does it create? How do the different powers react? Uh, that's the focus of our storytelling for the, the immediate future. And you know, we have ideas going past that, but it's, it's that kind of knock-on effect that we're we're dealing with. Uh, we, we have to, you know, there's no way we could skip over it or say, well, that all happened. Different story we can tell over here. Um, there are many stories we can tell, but there are some immediate impacts that we've got to try and uh, uh, get into. Right, and I think one of the things that I'm very excited about this aspect is... Yes, it's finally happened. There is an ill Kong, there's an ill clan, but the reverberations throughout the inner sphere that we'll be exploring as things come to pass is it just allows for a lot of potential shakeup. And we're approaching that carefully because obviously we don't want to break the universe, but there's just so much potential there for these epic stories that we can dive into. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and, and to that point, Ian. Drasari asks, you've been crashing down, nearly destroying a lot of fan favorites like the Jade Falcons and Fed Sons. Are you going to complete one of those destructions? <laughs> Are you afraid of fan backlash? Um, it's not, I mean, going into this knowing that you can't please 100% of the base all the time, it's just a fact. We, we, we try to tell stories that are going to appeal to most people, but understanding there's always going to be those elements that are, for one reason or another, have uh, differences of opinion over how stories are told. But um, as if you've read our, and I'm not going to spoil anything here because some people on the feed have not read the book yet, and I don't want to spoil anything for anyone, you know that certain things have happened, that certain clans have been, um, we're going to say reconfobled, and leave it at that. Uh, but it's, I think, and Brent, one of the rules that he likes to live by, and I think it's a good rule, is, is you know don't take something away from the fans that they really like and have fought for and expect to have. It's very, you know, it's very, I wouldn't want to risk alienating a portion of the fan base by taking out their favorite faction, whether it's clan, industry, or whatever. It just doesn't seem... It seems like punishment for those of you who have stood by this game for 25, 30 years, who have played it, who have evangelized it, who have brought other people in, and then suddenly say, oh, by the way, that faction you've loved for all this time, what's well, gone now? That that doesn't seem right to me. As a, as a, as a, you know, Things have to change, but at the same time, that seems unnecessarily cruel, to be honest. So I'm not a big fan of that, unless story-wise it's necessary. Now, since you mentioned the Jade Falcons, because of how they were been portrayed in the Dark Age and further, I think we had to do a major kind of, I'm going to say conversion. And again, I'm going to leave that to the book. Those of you who have already read it know what's happened there and know what's going to happen going forward, which is going to be interesting to see how they 
shall we say, rise from their current status. I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I don't know if anyone else has other comments about that, but I'd sort of like to hear them if they do. I mean, change is real, right? Like, to the point of get rid of factions, like a total cross-off, that's, as John said, not, not the goal or not an intent. But they do evolve. They do change. I mean, that's part of stories. Stories have to have consequences. There has to be change. And I think, you know, that's something we're focused on, is how are these factions going to evolve? How do new characters come to the fore and, and change the direction of, of you know, factions and logos that people root for. Um, that's something we're definitely focused on. Yeah, In fact, I, one of the things with that is that a lot of the great stories come out of the wreckage you're left with. It's not like any faction will die and go away. Oh, they they still yes. exist there. Um, and ultimately, when you really think about it, since great stories come out of conflict and choices, those are the areas where the most interesting conflict and choices are faced by the characters in the story. So one of our biggest things is not to um, kill any faction or bring up any faction or anything else like that. Our primary goal is two things. Tell fantastic stories that remain respectful and true to the players and universe that love Battletech. So that's the way we approach it. Yeah, I mean, we, we talked about this early on, too, in 2017 when we first met. It's We recognized that one faction was going to have to suffer uh, in Hour of the Wolf, what would eventually become Hour of the Wolf, which would be the Republic of the Sphere. And the Republic of the Sphere really represented the Dark Ages. It, it wasn't a long-standing faction. It was there for the Dark Ages, and I know it brought a lot of fans in. If you're going to do something on that scale, you have to do it respectfully of of that fan base so it had to be covered in fiction in an epic manner and it had to be done in a way that was very respectful to the fans but at the same time made it worth the while if you saw them go down they went down it's very rare that we actually have a faction that disappears and there's ramifications of that from a story perspective and uh I sent a story over to Phil, and I know John's going to take a look at it soon, is what happens after all of this? You've got this entire military that's been told to stand down. Um, what happens at, from a mercenary perspective at the hiring halls of you know the mercenary star when you are flooded with former RAF people who are full of their equipment, et cetera, are looking for employment, you know, those, and it really does open up some great opportunities for new stories. While the faction of the Republic of the Sphere suffered a great deal through all this, uh, I think it, in the end, it really comes through with some really cool follow-on stories. And I think that's going to excite some of the fans. It's uh, like the, the faction is gone, but the people are still there. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. They don't go away, except for those who fail in battle, of course. Uh, <laughs> Curtis Thompson, on a scale of 1 to 10, how screwed are the Dragoons? Well, I mean, they're hurt. At the end of 8, uh, they, you know, again, not trying to go into spoilers, but they're, they're, certainly, not, they're certainly not out by a long shot. Um, and we have plans for them, too. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of surprised that uh, the Krolls haven't popped in here yet, you know. Um, well, <laughs> and correct me if I'm wrong, Blaine, but... That's not all Absolutely. of the Wolf Dragoons. There were still Wolf Dragoons that were not on Terra. Correct. There's, I think, two battalions that didn't go. Um, right. But uh, the the Dragoons that went suffered a great deal. Um, and oh, there's yeah. a lot of ramifications of the events from Divide We Fall that I think are going to come into play here, too. You know, you, you had a mm. mutiny. You had Brubaker cover up that mutiny. You had them go to Terra lose 80% and, and and essentially come back with not a lot to show for it other than they helped Alaric become the Ilkhan. Uh, and I, I, there's going to be a reckoning, I would call it, that's going to happen at some point. Uh, I'm not writing that fiction, uh, but I, I know some of the folks that are probably in line for it. And I, I think that's going to be an awesome Dragoon story. I, the, the potential for for how they come to terms with this, what the Dragoons look like after this, um, 
I, I think it makes them much more interesting. A lot of people over the years have said they're a Mary Sue unit. Nothing bad ever happens to them. I don't know why people say that. It seems like they get wiped out every so often or darn <laughs> close to it. But, um, you know, if you walk away from Hour of the Wolf thinking that the Dragoons are still a Mary Sue unit, um, yeah, I think you've made a huge mistake. They, they've suffered grievously. And there's a lot of ramifications, I think, of what will follow from that. Absolutely. A uh, question uh, that yeah. passed by earlier, just because I was in the middle of trying to fix whatever the heck was going on, I finally found it. Um, any chance of reprinting the error report books to fit with the current game systems? It's gonna be a great question. The error report books. Um, it's not likely that we'll be reprinting the old ones. We may, in fact, tweak them like you suggest there and offer them print on demand. Uh, but complete reprints aren't very likely. Uh, then someone says, um, notice that a lot of ill clan recognition guides focused on Creed and Creed and mechs. Is there an attempt to build them up into more of a player in this era of war and politics? No more than any of the other factions, really. Uh, I've heard people say that, not just about Creed, but several of the other factions in there. And uh, once the entire recognition guides, the whole thing runs its course, you'll see that we've given everybody a pretty fair shake and if you see that anybody's underrepresented well they're buying from sea foxes <laughs> <laughs> and then brent because it is the spirit of the ama um someone asks how do you take your coffee uh every way i can get it <laughs> black in the morning because i stagger down the stairs and get it as fast as possible and i can't think clearly enough to put anything in it in proper measurements uh from from uh, uh starbucks i i go for the white mochas with almond milk because um i can't do dairy anymore but the white mocha is just a freaking amazing flavor so so there you go there's your answer if you ever meet me at a gen con on day three and i look haggard just bring me a white mocha with almond milk and i'll be happy <laughs> And then uh, Hour of the Wolf and Research Products have teased new characters. Can you give more information on new faces we'll see in the Ill Clan era? Ooh. <sighs> That's uh, a great one. That like, is. You got a couple? I know Ray does. <laughs> what? <laughs> Phil just wrote a novel about him. Yeah, someone asked what Phil's next novel is. Uh, let's, let's toss it up to Phil first so he can kind of tease what's coming out soon. And then we'll, we'll toss the ball to Blaine and Ray, too. Cause I'm, yeah. Uh, well, the, the next novel I've got coming out is going to be, it's, it's entitled Hunting Season. It's set um, in the Free Worlds League. Uh, in the years leading up to um, the uh, Hour of the Wolf and the Battle of Terra. Um, and it, co it covers uh, that, whole, uh, that whole period. Um, and... Then after that, I'm not entirely sure. I think I need. I think I'm working on another uh, Merrick-centered novella. Um, but you know, we'll. I'll, I'll talk about that with John and the story team <laughs> as that goes forward. <clears throat> exactly. Uh, Ray, Blaine, new characters. Well, besides, besides the tank crew. <laughs> Everybody, went, that's an old character now. Um, yeah. Those, those are old characters established in canon. Uh, yes, I, I just started a Jade Falcon novel. I just finished the prologue this morning of a uh, new Jade Falcon novel, um, and it's set in the Ill Clan era and, and the events that take place at post Hour of the Wolf. And you know, I, it, to me, it's I, I'm enjoying it a great deal. There's a great new character I have and. Uh, Hasara, and he's just this incredibly cool Jade Falcon, Sohama warrior. That uh, he's got a lot of he's got a lot of jazz to him. Uh, and I'm trying to really make sure, you know, a lot of what we've been doing is really focusing on the characters um, and making the characters pop and sizzle in books. And that, that doesn't mean that they're cookie cutter. This is a hero. This is a villain. The the, the lines between hero and villain get real blurry in the hour of the wolf era. And I, I'm hoping you guys caught some of that. And 
you know, the Jade Falcons have gone through a hell of a lot, and not everyone got to go to Terra. So there were um, some Sibcos that were left behind. There were Falconers left behind. There were some Solhama troops that, you know, if the, if the opportunity was, do I pack ammo or pack Solhama troops, they packed ammo. Um, so some of those got left behind. And, and those folks, can you imagine if you missed out on the greatest event in a hundred years of clan, his, of clan history, you know, and, and that hey, really your, uh, up, is coming through. It really opens up some great stories, I think, for for characters. I think there really is some good opportunities there. So I'm having some fun with the Falcons for a change. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, Ray, uh, there must be something you want to tease or, or mention what's coming up, maybe? Well, um, if you guys have picked up uh, the book Legends, we have uh, the yeah. final section there is the Oak Clan section, so we have some characters you're already familiar with in the Dark Age that are still going to get attention, and some brand new ones we dropped in there to hint of what's to come. And we've also been working on some new characters, some of which Blaine is talking about. There's a lot going on with the Jade Falcon still. Um, it's not as cookie-cutter as it may have appeared by the end of Hour of the Wolf. Um, so we have some more interesting characters in the next few short stories and novels and uh, source book that we're working on. Including the return of Snords Irregulars. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And, uh, among and others. others. Among others. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Uh, uh, ELH, we've got a big project coming. that's going to be happening this year for the Light Horse. I'm very excited about that. I wanted to touch base. I wanted to leap back real quick. Unless anyone else had anything else to say about the characters, there was an interesting question from uh, Eddie that I wanted to mention, especially from Blaine. Because he asked, do we feel that any, are there any aspects of ours plot that we feel have been maybe either overlooked or misinterpreted by the reader base? And I'm curious if, if Blaine or others had, you know, judging by what people have said in the reviews and such as that, if, if anyone has any thoughts on that. If they thought something was either overrepresented, underrepresented, I thought our did exactly what it was supposed to. We've never really done, as far as I know, a campaign in a novel from start to finish. I don't believe we have. It's always been taking bits and pieces of it as part of a larger narrative. And I thought our did exactly what we wanted to do in the, the lead up to these pieces all coming together. But I give the floor over to folks if they think that, you know, everyone here has read the book. If anyone thinks that someone has missed something or this should have gotten right. more play as importance. Uh, anyone? Anyone? Bueller? There's a dozen little Easter eggs in there that have been <laughs> overlooked. Um, yeah, and I, and I love putting those in there for some of the Battletech fans. Um, there, there's one in children that, that everybody overlooked where I talk about the uh, Ghosts of the Avengers, which is a hint to Ar Archer's Avengers. Uh, that slid by everyone in edit, which so it's perfect. Um, <laughs> and right now, Ray is going, God damn it, I'm going to kill him. The, uh, <laughs> or, yeah, hey, that could be cool. Let's play with that. Um, I think the biggest area where people have, have I don't want to say misinterpreted, but where there's been a lot of open interpretation is Stone's final um, tribute to Alaric at the end of the book. Um, <laughs> there's been a lot of no, 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 he was lying. No, 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 he's completely telling the truth. I don't know if Alaric would react this way or not. And, uh, you know, there's been a lot of interpretation read into that because there's a lot of potential implications of that. Um, to which I just say, you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, Stone. <laughs> well, no, honestly, the same can be said about the final interaction with the Wolf Dragoons. Just, mm. just how massive a shakeup that is and implies yeah well you've got dragoons falcons a reconstituted uh a reinvigorated clan that's been that that's been going on for a while long time is again our the wolf is a springboard for a lot to come yes. in the sphere uh absolutely uh yeah someone mentioned is there going to be a source book yes it's being worked on right now for the old clan the old clan the campaign itself absolutely hey john uh, can we touch base real quick on another little element of that last question Absolutely. Um, for those of you that were paying attention a few years back when we released Shattered Fortress, and then we started releasing novels or novellas about different sections or, or battles or moments in there that were mentioned, but not really explored in detail. 
Um, and th that was very intentional. As, as uh, Ray Randall and I kind of overhauled the line and how we deliver stuff, we realized the old idea of trying to shoehorn every story in is just not the way to do it. There's there's some things that can only sto some stories that can only be told properly with real full fiction and let the authors run with it. Uh, and so you'll for those of you look that go through Ill Clan, I'm sure you're noticing there are a huge amount of areas where let's say like the invasion of Japan. I mean, there are so many spots where there was almost nothing said other than it was complimented that basically something happened here and then they just moved right on. Those were all very intentional. So every one of those is the seed for a future story that will unfold and unveil new plots, new characters, new nuances, every one of those things that will have ramifications that plays out later down, down the road. And the more you think about it, as you go through the stories that are told in Hour of the Wolf, you realize there's probably a hundred plot points that will spin out of this book that will unveil things in corners of the inner sphere that have nothing to do with Terra. And yet that's where these things are going to un uh, unspin to. Yeah, I did see, uh, speaking of Japan, I did see one question where someone asked if there would be information about Japan in the campaign book. Um, the answer to that, to that question is yes, but it might not be quite as much as uh, as you want because it's it's not a very large section, but it is there. <clears throat> is it going to be called Tokyo Drift? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I believe I believe it's titled uh, "What Happened to Tau Galaxy." It's from a uh, uh, it's an excerpt from. A uh, Mysteries of the Battle of Terra uh, in-universe book is, is what that section is. So another question that I had from earlier is, was, will we see more Alpha Strike-focused material? Really enjoy the format. <laughs> yeah, it's... It's, muted, it's baked into virtually every product we make. We do Alpha Strike conversions. We offer compatibility for all the game product we make. I mean, it's no longer a either or um, kind of game product. I mean, we, we support them, support them both. Another one that we have was, what is it about the Ill Clan era that appeals to each of you? Great question. Blaine, you want to go first? <laughs> Yeah, that's just so you guys could think of an answer. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm, I'm I know how this works. I've already yeah, stated mine. You know what I ahead. like about it is we've got new characters. We've got um, it, it's it's one of those things where it's one thing to wish that you could conquer, and then when you conquer, you're now left with now I have to rule, and nobody is exactly with, with the exception of uh, you know the Snow Ravens and the Sea Foxes who who has acquiesced to uh, Alaric. It's not like the whole inner sphere is rejoicing over this and looking forward to it. Now, it opens up a lot of potential conflict and a lot of potential stories. Um, we introduce a plethora of characters in Hour of the Wolf, and the intent is, you know, some of them do die, obviously, but there's enough of them that live on that you, you want to kind of get those stories carried forward. And, and I'm sure other authors will pick up on some of these characters and write about them. Um, people want that stuff. And, and so a lot of what we were doing with our was laying that foundation for a lot of good fiction. And I think we've, we've definitely built a good foundation to do that with. And that's what excites me as a writer with the Dark Ages, it was always a struggle to get going with something that was exciting because you had this dark cloud hanging over it and it didn't seem like it was driving towards a finality. And, and by giving it a finality, we could still tell Dark Ages stories. We, you know, those are still out there. But I think people are really going to enjoy uh, a new era where it's like, okay, so how how are these various factions like the Ghost Bears or the Combine going to react when they get word of this? And, and it'll be interesting to see. Yeah, Blaine's answer is pretty much my answer. It opens up storytelling opportunities across the inner sphere that are different, that are new, that are moving it forward. So pretty much. Anyone else? Um, 
I, I, I think my my favorite thing about going into a new era is the fact that we we actually get to like chart brand new territory. Like for me as a writer, for example, like I first started working on uh, the draft of what I call Ill Clan 1.0 back in mid 2013, um, and then that that draft uh, got uh, you know put on the shelf for for a couple of years, and then it was eventually about 80 percent of that was published um, in slightly different form as Shattered Fortress, and then I started working on Ill Clan one or what I call Ill Clan 2.0 which is what is going to be the actual Ill Clan book. And that, that book went through a couple of different revisions as well. So it's like moving to a new era is just like a, a way to, it's to get a clean break from the Dark Age and just move, move on into uncharted uh, territory to tell brand new stories in a brand new era. So. Yeah, I hate to admit it, but the new stories and the things of, of what this lets us do is exactly what was the most exciting to me. And it wasn't exciting about the space around Terra. For me, it was, you know, what's the worst things that could possibly happen to the clans? And the answer was they actually get what they want. Oh. And, and the, the ramification of, of that particular implosion happening is going to, you know, ripples from a pond across the entire inner sphere, and it is going to be massive. This is going to change a lot of things, and it won't be good for the clans. I don't know if it's going to be good for anybody, but it will <laughs> definitely be interesting, because the storylines suddenly take on a whole different tone. The inner sphere for, a, for quite a while had kind of been under a uh, a laissez-faire, we've got an equilibrium thing. This is going to tip the scales in so many ways. Um, and admittedly, the the plot lines that the author core have been discussing, um, they're not shallow, 12-year-old, one-dimensional kind of things. It's like, really, what happens if? Really think it through. What are the ramifications? And one of the biggest ones, actually, I've seen those the questions come through on the, on the, the questions threads. Um, the HPGs are still mostly down. Terra is going to fall. There will be an ill clan, and almost nobody will know it. What right. the heck does that mean? How do people hear? And and what do they actually hear? Because it's going to be the biggest game of of that thing where you you pass the message from one monkey to the next monkey to the next monkey and see what comes out the other side. This is going to be a a, a titanic mess. And one of the most beautiful things is that um, you know, like the people on this call. We have put together all the dangling plot threads that we have acquired over the last decade, and we are going to answer all of those dangling plot threads as we move forward in the backdrop of a setting that suddenly just got turned on its end. Speaking of which, there is an old business item that has come up many times. I've been watching it. The fans argue about it in the background. <laughs> the mystery character of who is shimmer <laughs> i'm sorry i'm swung to secrecy on that uh sh yeah i had a question sh i had someone who had a question on uh shimmer too at some point yep Kay. shimmer is a character that was actually introduced in another author's book in the dark ages um, there have been subtle little hints. I will say this. One fan in Facebook posted up on a forum and they said, I think Shimmer is blank. And I, I just about my jaw hit the floor because they got it right. Um, but that's one. <laughs> uh, uh, the I rest of them have one made guesses. Only one person gets it right. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I don't think... I think that story has to be released. You have to get to that story in fiction. I think saying it right now would kind of ruin it. Uh, but it is a character that was introduced in a story. And, you know, it, it, it goes from there. And I think that's kind of fun. You know, John, I don't think you want me to, to ruin it by actually saying who it is, do you? No, no. I mean, no, I don't. I think it'd be... <laughs> got to go in and find the breadcrumbs and see if they can come up with their own theories. Certain exactly. things. Yeah, so, so, so it's for been the awesome watching the fans 
like go over back and forth and arguing who they think is making their own championship arguments and forth. Uh, but one of the beautiful things about Shimmer, I'm, yeah, I won't tell you who it is. Uh, I love in the guesses. Uh, but what I will say is that, you know, back to that core thing of um, you have to make sure that you treat the characters and the fans with respect. This character from the Dark Age received the biggest disrespect I've just about ever seen. There's only a handful of characters that were handled so badly by their authors. Uh, and so this character is getting the the future story that they deserved from that. So there you go. So for, uh, so for the person who said Shimmer, Terra Bishop, new character, another old character entirely hopefully that answers your question um by not answering but now <laughs> by not answering <laughs> exactly um so another question we have is kind of more directed at me and kind of at the team in general which was uh be becoming the packs unplugged this year i've seen that ha come up twice now so our stance on any of the cons not just packs unplugged but this is going to be going for gen con if it happens or any of the other smaller conventions that you're used to seeing is too is that we're not going to send people out there until it is safe to do so. Um, because we're not going to go out to a show only to come back, you know, a casket or anything like that. Uh, so that means that hopefully most of the teams who do go out will be vaccinated and that, you know, everything that we do will be done at, when it, at a time where it is safe for us to actually travel and be with other people. Um, especially in mass groups of people where there's very little space to find, you know, that six foot distancing that we that we kind of need right now to keep safe. Um, so hopefully it's, it's not a very in-depth question or in-depth answer, but hopefully that the answers is pretty much just when it's safe to do so. So even if PAX Unplugged or Gen Con basically said, yeah, we're opening up and you know, we were still months out from being able to, to get vaccines for the team or anything like that, we would probably refuse to show up and, and just hold our positions for next year when we have the opportunity to do so. We, we just we our, our main goal is to keep everyone in the company safe and to not force our fans to also do the same thing which is go out into an unsafe environment when it's just potentially deadly to do so oh. okay. um so another person I had following up from an earlier question uh nope that's uh, uh that was pdx con same thing when the world is safe so for our eu fans who enjoyed seeing us at pdx con and and uh, the other uh, overseas show that we went to, named is blanked on it. Essen. Essen. Thank you. Essen. Um, same thing. When it's safe to do so. Um, between the success of the Kickstarter, the recent release of the technical readout Jihad, and other products, can we expect Ill Clan related releases once a year, more or less? At least uh, once a year. At least, yeah, and supported by a good deal of fiction. Yeah, um, yeah. So, you know, we're we're moving forward, full. I don't know, full engines ahead. Steam doesn't really work for this context, so you know. Uh, but yeah, we're we're all we're full bore, absolutely. <laughs> there it is. I was waiting for that to happen. Uh, someone just asked, by the way, I want to put this out. Someone asked about audio for the what we've done. For, I'm going to say from bonfire on, and and I. Ironically or, or serendipitously, I'm apt. That is absolutely what I'm putting Trent Sparks, our kind of our voice of Battletech, on. He's going to do the whole run from Bonfire up to Hour. So that will be coming. It's going to take a while because you can only read and, and edit those things so quickly. But I figured I, I've done GDL and um, Price of Glory will be coming out in April. And then I'm going to have him move on to the new stuff because it's good to have those in audio. So. Patience, but they'll start coming out later this uh, later this year. Uh, someone asks, uh, so we're getting a hammerhead in plastic? Question mark. <laughs> Eventually, uh, definitely, definitely in metal. Definitely coming in metal. I don't know when. As far as plastic, that's where. Like Brent said, we're waiting for wave two. Um, not a question that I think that we have a number on just because it's kind of out of left field. How many canon characters have been earmarked from the Kickstarter and how many people asked to be part of the Ill Clan era? Unfortunately, I don't think we really got a number on that just because, you know, that's, that's kind of a question that we would have to, you know, actually go and look at our spreadsheets and 
and actually pull the data for. So unfortunately, I don't think we have a way to answer that question. <laughs> Um, I think this has been asked before. Any plans for support in Roll20 or other computer RPG platforms? Um, I think that we've said in other AMAs that we are giving support in Roll20. Is that correct? Or, or is that, that for Shadowrun? That would be that would be great. Um, I think it might be more of a Shadowrun thing. I would love to have more support in Roll20. We should really look into how yeah, we can make that happen. To my knowledge, we don't have any support for any of the VTTs. Not, not officially. Right. Um, someone else asks, why are so many dead units being brought back? I'm concerned that things are going to turn into the comic book where everyone gets revived over and over. A little bit of a tougher question. Well, on a certain, on, on the one I think that they're asking in specifically, uh, I actually think try to do things from the purpose of in in the universe as does it make sense. And for that particular aspect, I think it absolutely makes sense given what Alaric stated about that particular clan. Uh, I agree with the reasoning for the character, and I think it does make sense as to why they did it. Are we going to make it a, a, a always thing? No. Now, once again, there's still going to be no Clan Wolverine. I'm going to put that out there right now. For those of you who don't like that answer, sorry. But no, certain things are going to remain dead because they have to. But other things, if there's a plausible and not certifiable, justifiable reason for it, which in this case I believe there is, then yes. But we're not. I don't think we're going to make a habit of it, for sure. No, he, yeah, John completely is right. It all comes back to our focus on, on the characters. And, and part of it comes down to, you know, when you really think about it, can you imagine the descendants of these people not doing it? Can you imagine, you know, how would these things, what would they do or not do? Uh, and that's that's the litmus test that we're using. It's not like we're going through the the list of things from the 80s and 90s thing and thinking how many lunch boxes we can sell through the merchandising department. That's That's not our goal. But the goal is absolutely on focusing on the stories and, and what happens. And the idea that these stories, it's not like one person lives a life and they die and now they're gone. Some of these characters have legacies that live on beyond them because they're part of a play that has been going on for a thousand years. And and their part of it may have had repercussions beyond their lifespan. So, Well, not only that, you know, when you look at this, some of these units aren't dead. Um, and I think that's there's a misnomer there. So, you know, we've seen, for example, I, I went straight to source book material when I was trying to look at how to rekindle a little bit of Snards of Regulars, and the unit's still there, uh, has been there all along. So it was a matter of, you know, really giving them some window dressing in the new era. And I think that's an important approach. Uh, there's going to be some new units that are formed as well. And I think that's going to be some great opportunities for for both the fans who who back the Kickstarter, who you know want to look for that mercenary lifestyle, and some of the others, um, you know, I think there's some great opportunities there. But we don't do it unless it makes sense. But you got to remember, these mercenary units are a brand. If you were alive in in that era, and you think about some of these names, they're household names when it comes to mercenary units, and you'd be stupid to not leverage that name. Uh, going forward because it carries some weight and it carries a rating, you know, that, that applies to it. Yeah. Another Absolutely. thing that's worth to follow up, up is that, the, um, that a lot of the units that are coming back, it's not like we are flipping a switch. Hey, suddenly, suddenly they're back. Like these are stories that, that we've laid uh, seeds and groundwork for. And they're like, um, they're, it's just the, the natural growth of, of that as to why a lot of these units come back. To, uh, to follow up what Blaine said, uh, I found the same thing in my research. One of the first large things I found was the 21st Centauri Lancers. A huge unit that goes back to the very first publication of, of the Battletech Battle Droids box. And they're mentioned in the early dark age literature they're there but they didn't show up in the source books they didn't disappear they weren't wiped out it's just the source books took a smattering of 
of what's there. There's more there than what we've seen in the most recent source books. So like Blaine says, and um, I like comic books and they seem to be a big <laughs> part of our media now. And I really don't see an issue. Bringing back the Great Death Legion is not like saying uh, Victor Steiner Davian's come back to life and he's 25. So I don't <laughs> we're, think we're, we're not cloning him. Okay, good. No. <laughs> yeah, it's more like a different Somebody character. The plug. It's more like a different character, you know, picking up the mantle, like how Miles yep. Morales is is, is Spider Man. Yep. You know, yeah. yeah. So, uh, what was everyone's favorite or least favorite part of the process in getting to the Ill, uh, getting the Ill Clan story in Hour of the Wolf? I, you know, I'm going to start with this one. I uh, least favorite and I, I don't want to i don't want to cast any aspersion on what came before but it was really kind of untangling everything we'd been left with and trying to figure out how to move forward in a way that put a final a closing kind of coda on the dark age and then move forward into a new one and it was complicated there was a lot of things that were left there were certain directions that were fairly clear but we had to untangle it and just kind of drop some things. And, you know, we, we try to keep the retconning to a bare minimum, but there were some things that had to be like, no, we're just going to let that go and not speak to it and just move forward in this way. That was, that was complex. It was a complex process to get where we are. I'm, I'm happy with where we are now, but it was a, I wouldn't say it was a struggle. It was just, it was a complex not to untangle. I think that's the best way to put it in my opinion. I'll admit there was one moment that just still stands out to me because there were many great moments, so it's hard to pick one, but there was one that just has that iconic ring that someone like Blaine seems to be able to do better than anyone. Uh, it is to pull out the historical importance of things when, when Alaric takes his wolves to Scotland and issues the Highlanders the challenge, we're here, I dare you to come get us. And, and just... It, no apologies, no nothing. We are friggin' here on your spot. We are squatting. I friggin' dare you. There's just something about the nuance with that kind of move, which if you look historically back through wars, stuff like that always seems to just, it's like somebody flipping the table. I mean, it, <laughs> everything changes. Everybody <laughs> behaves in a way that they wouldn't normally. All of you carefully lay plans. Ah, screw it. I'm doing this. And, and, and I kind of love that the nuance, the honesty of that moment where the Highlanders are like, we're not going to let it stand. We know full well it's a trick. We don't friggin' care. We're going to come kick the horn at that. Uh, and, I, and I love that. I would say the biggest challenge that we faced early on was doing some of the space battle stuff. And, and in all the edits, John and I went back and forth a lot on space battles. And... Yeah, I'm a big proponent of having, I wanted one. Um, there were some things I wanted that, I, you know, John, I, I told John at one point, I'm not prepared to die on this hill. <laughs> you know, so I'm going to have to concede that point, but there's other things I can't concede. And and I think, I think you had to have a space battle to do that. We don't have a lot of those in Battletech. We just, you know, and when we do do them, they need to be, recognizable and big and enjoyable and there was a lot of nuance that we went back and forth about space combat which really opened up a lot of old wounds about aerospace and some of the rules and i mean it, it gets bogged down in some of the details but we also know some of the fans are gonna go right to the rule book and go but that's not how that works and things along those lines so yeah and some of the stuff that's in the rule books that are now how many years old 30 years old they're a little bit obsoleted and probably could stand a little updating um so there there were some nuances there that i think that were i don't want to say frustrating but it, it was there was at one point someone had made a comment why don't we just not have the space battle and i was like no i want to blow things up in space and you know so it was a question of how do we get to that and we made some pretty substantive changes as we went through that that was not fun but in the end i think you end up with a good product and so you you know sometimes it's like making sausage you don't really want to see the process behind the screens <laughs> yeah actually you bring up a really interesting point that i know i get questions on it at every convention uh, of the nuance of when you're on the creative team and you're trying to tell the stories but you're also trying to balance it with the game 
mechanics where some of the, con- the oh. mechanics take a lot of hand <laughs> waving to swallow. Um, I think that the space battle was the one that we we had the hardest time swallowing because the rules for certain things there really flew in the face of what Ooh. people would actually do. And yeah. then the mo- it was funny because at some point in the conversation, it always came back with someone saying the phrase, well, the actual physics, and the, and as soon as you said actual physics, you're like, dude, this is Battletech. You can't, yeah, you can't. <laughs> so yeah, like, that's not good ground to stand on. <laughs> yeah, and I set my hand wavium to cancel out your physics. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so it's be it limits. turns out the sword that'll cut through everything and the shield that'll stop through everything. <laughs> the, ultimately, the, the determination on which one wins is what makes the best story. And that's where we need to default of yeah. not totally dying on the field of this is the rule mechanic in a hex based system yeah. but it's it, to, to, to tell you on that just very briefly uh i was a big fan of having the space battle in there not only because that's where icons of war stopped as i recall no uh, 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 uh children of Kerensky stopped with them giving the order to jump and i'm like well we're not just going to skip into terra uh but i i, I there is a contingent i think a fairly large fan contingent that likes the space battles and uh, that wants to see more of them and i thought starting hour with this epic and it is a pretty damn epic space battle of how they drive into the system i think was important to show uh because otherwise it's just like well they teleported in no they had to suffer and fight in, in the forces and we got to show admiral labby and everyone else there's there's like these guys are coming they're not going to stop until they get here it, it set the stakes higher it, it already raised what were high stakes as it was even higher with them like we can't stop these guys you know the fight was i think viable and and important to show on the page so yeah well and it was really cool because this is the first time i can think of where the the wolves jump in and they are intentionally leaving forces alive because they want the malvina to have to fight their way through things and like, strategy yes yeah yes tactics and strategy well yeah. and my favorite was typing a footnote to jod going there i make a comment about there's over 400 drop ships here and i'm like he, you know john here's how i arrived at these calculations <laughs> this is how big yep. a galaxy is this is how many ships it takes this is what they could carry and x percent would be carrying munitions spare parts extra battle max but I, and I, I went to this I, it's actually longer than the actual page the footnote of how we figured out there were 400 and i kept waiting for the democratic rebuttal from the fact checkers who are going to go oh no it's 528 or whatever and and no it, they were like yeah that sounds right <laughs> we we did a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of the math and the forces and how they were going to get over there to the degree you can in the context of the universe. Let's let's yeah. Cuz we want this to have at least the the ring of I'm going to say reality for a thousand years of future history. Um with big stompy mechs, you know, it's got to sound like it's actually viable in in a lot of ways. And and space is no different. But yeah, once as as Brent said, once you get into physics like, well, you got to look beyond all that. So <laughs> Big, big yeah, greens of salt. That. I still love that idea of the scene of being in Australia and <laughs> seeing what feels like all of the stars descending because there's that many dropships. Yeah. Just the vibe of that where you're like, you know, like we, we've got 37 now, 37 years worth of history of, of, of you see one dropship coming down on a planet and everybody on the planet was like, Oh, that's ominous. Oh no. You know, what's it mean? And the idea of having a swarm of drop ships coming down, totally different set of rules. Exactly. Exactly. All right. All right. Um, Other questions I have is homeworld clans. And you mentioned them in the near future. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not near future. So, somewhere in the far future. If, well, for, for what it's worth, behind closed doors, we are battling out exactly how we want to do and what stories. Because there's been several proposed stories. Um, and and then part of that comes down, okay, that's a good story, but when in the, it, when in the timeline does it need to happen? <laughs> uh, and, and so the honest truth is none of us really have nailed down a specific on that one because there is a huge number of implications with that and it's all going to come down to what makes the strongest story yeah but that topic to jump on that because i as the fiction side am a big fan of figuring out what's going on there will will be coming up at some point um because it's an aspect that we've kind of 
I don't want to say left behind, but put on pause. And I think there's some fascinating stories to tell. They're not only in the history, like the Pentagon Wars and all that stuff that we haven't even touched on in fiction, but what, what is going on now exactly. But right now we're more IS focused, um, but it will come up. It will come up because I want it to. I think, I think there's that aspect of it is important to tell. So the answer is later rather than sooner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In time, in time. Um, another one of these, I see a Dragoon's hat. Why are you guys not selling faction hats? I love hats. Um, actually, I can. I think, unless Ray wants to take it, I know the answer to this one kind of as well. Or Brent. Uh, no, if either of you have an answer. So what really it was that we did hats like long, long we, we did hats long, long ago. And we absolutely thought they just sucked massive wind. Uh, we are looking at new avenues for putting in hats. It's been talked about within the team about getting new apparel done. Um, we are just trying to find something that we are happy with. So that way you guys will not just have to settle for the thing that we just happen to find. Uh, we really want the any new hats or any new apparel to actually be of good quality. Not like they were, you know, yes. think like six years ago when they were just like some, some very simple, oh. very cheap snapback hats that were still too expensive for what they were back in the time. So that's the politically correct answer. The non-politically correct answer is that Ray and I are champions of hats. Lauren is not. And Randall doesn't wear them. So we keep trying to get Lauren to play poker with us so that we can at some point in time have him on the ropes and then bet him that we can actually do hats. And, and it hasn't come about yet. But we want to do hats that are actually quality hats. I, Ray and I are like, Give us the $40 fitted hats. We'll, 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 we'll do the full embroider. We'll go the full meal deal. These should yep. be NFL quality, you know, yes. pro level hats. That's what we need to have for Battletech. Not the, I got these for two ninety nine dollars off Etsy hats that like <laughs> lowest possible denominator. Cause those are not great. We want good quality iron on hats. from a cereal yeah. box. Yeah. Uh, exactly. I like, I like the throw of Lauren there underneath the bus. Oh, it's just a matter of the battle back and forth. Cause he, and yeah, he, it, it really shouldn't be. The hats are, A, it's branding for us. It's iconic. It identifies. I don't see why he's giving us pushback on this. I really don't. So there we go. Uh, just because he's the one hats. that looks at the bottom line and the costs on things. And, and for what it's worth, that's not our biggest fans and biggest opponents. We'll say Catalyst has done an astonishingly good job stretching their dollars at every step of the way over the course of the growth of this company. We run lean like nobody's ever been able to pull off. It's amazing. So his ability to turn a dollar into 10 is really impressive. But there's sometimes where a premium product needs to be a premium pro product. And so Ray just had, we keep losing at poker against Lauren. It, we just, they need a winning hand <laughs> on this particular item. <laughs> on day three, when he's like half a bottle into whiskey and we're good, then we'll, then we'll have the hats. That's what it's going to take. Yeah. You play the people, not the pockets. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Morning after a night with Ken. We'll get him there. Oh. <laughs> Anyways. That's right. Um, question, will the, will the Dark Age books finally get to EPUB again, or are we still waiting on rights? I think we can make the announcement here. I'm, I'm comfortable. I want to do a, a big PR thing, but it's fine. Hey, it's, 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 an, it's a good little tidbit for those who, who showed up yes. first to the AMA. And actually, this, this is going to lead into a couple of things I'm going to go on for a little bit. Uh, the answer is yes. We're actually working on those right now, literally. Uh, the Dark Age novels, we've gotten the approvals finally from all internals to start working on them, and they are in play. Um, poor Brent is <laughs> massively trying to rush the covers. They're going to come out with new cover art, which I'm very excited about. Not as excited about the Dark Age mechs we have to put on them, but that's that's beside the point. That's beside the point. New cover art. New cover art's awesome. Uh, and, and and we've got Tan. Can I mention the artist who's doing these? Yeah, by all means, Tan Ho Sim. Tan Ho Sim, one of our new fantastic artists, is doing these. It's, it's going to be fantastic. So, very happy about that. Um, as a side question, because I've noticed a, th a thread of things coming through. Someone mentioned the GDL coming back. There was another comment about, hey, what about Robert Thurston coming back? And I will mention, I think this is going to screw up the camera, but I'm going to put up this. Oh, you can't see it. Nope, you can't see it. Um, we do have a new book coming out this year by. Bill, by Bill Keith, uh, the GDL circa era 3025, basically continuing off of Price of Glory. Um, as for Bob, we did get in touch with him to do the signed editions of the Jade Phoenix trilogy. Unfortunately, due to physical conditions, because he's, let's face it, he's not young. 
he's pretty much retired from writing. I would love to reach out to some of the other writers uh, as we see fit to bring them back into the fold. Like I said, my big get this year was Bill Keith, and I'm, I'm, I couldn't be more thrilled to bring a new GDL novel out from him. I think it's going to be very exciting. At the same time, we are strongly noodling with, I'm going to spill little beans on this, there's, there's going to be a GDL 2.0 that we're in the process of finishing up. As we have that, The character is in Legends, right? We put them in there, right? Right? Is that the thing? Yeah. One of them, yeah. One of them, yeah. yeah. So that is underway. So, you know, as a one that's it's, it's reconstituted because it, talk about something getting done dirty, in my humble opinion, I think the way the GDO went out was one of the biggest ones. Um, so and that's a whole big thing we're not going to get into. But the whole point of having the GDO come back, I think, is, is it just makes sense because, as Brent said, these are brands. They're not just units, they're brands. And in this universe, the greatest Legion of Duty's weight to it um, that people will come to both on the employer side and the employee side. I think it's important to bring that, but also to show how it's um, evolved in the past, you know, couple hundred years since it existed previously. So kind of tying up a whole bunch of little, little threads into one kind of ball there. Yeah. You know what? Some of the most satisfying conversations that we've had after hours over the last year or two um, between John, me, Ray has been talking about, the Great Death Legion, and not that we're trying to rebuild what the Great Death Legion was, because that's not the story. The story is imagine four generations later the descendants and what they now basically inherited. Uh, you know, you, you've had, you all have imagined the amount of drama that happens when families split, and 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 for the most part, families with a lot of money involved have much more amplified drama. Well, the Grace and Death Carlisle's heirs, there was a massive amount of technology, licensing, production capability and stuff that was going on well into the Dark Age and stuff. We know that. That was all well established. It, it's kind of like, look at Henry Ford II, Henry Ford III. Hen, you, know, you start counting off generations down and multiplying people that have a claim on that, the, the heir, and, and you end up with just a real wonderful mess. Um, where there's some really great stuff of, of uh, you know, like how many of them are villains? How many of them are broken? How many of them are just like, uh, I've ignored this long enough, my dad did nothing, and I can no longer stand by? You, there's a lot of interesting stories that can be told with the people that have inherited, they've literally lived their lives under the specter of who their great-great-grandfather was a, in a way that he was legendary across the inner sphere. Imagine growing up under that pressure. It would kind of suck. So, you know, you think about the stories that come out of it. Uh, Ray has had some brilliant insights. You know, he said several things were like, oh, yeah, we had to write that down right away. Otherwise, we're going to forget that because that's friggin' cool. And, he, and, and, and Ray gets the, the guts of, of who these people are and where they are in the space of the inner sphere and all the tensions that are going on there that is just wonderfully organically honest. So I'm really looking forward to the Great Death Legion stories to come. Another thing, guys, of... Um, will the interstitial stories from the out-of-print gameplay and source books ever be rolled into one big book? I've seen that come up twice now, so I just wanted to make sure it got answered. Will the what stories? Interstitial fiction from the game books be collected in their own <sighs> volumes. Um, that's an interesting question. Uh... I am a fan of the idea. We're experimenting with that a little bit on the Shadowrun side, and I think we're actually going to start looking at that on the Battletech side as well. Whether that particular aspect of it, I don't know. Um, it, it's very much in its nascent beginning stages and see how that plays out. So the, my best answer is qualified, maybe. Um, let's see here. Thoughts on Lament? Mex, are we going to see more of it in Ill Clan? I think it's the new face of modern battle tech. Yeah, I replied to that in text. Uh, okay. The Lament is a great mech. It's a it's a Republic era mech. The Republic was producing several uh, mechs that were really only designs for the Republic, um, and so those are not going to go away as we move through and and, and into the Ill Clan era. Uh, Ray probably has specific designs on what's going where, but uh, yeah, all of those Republic of the Sphere mechs they're not going to stop producing those they will have places uh, and i'm glad that you like the technology and the nuance of that mech because it, it's a it's very much like a warhammer but it's got a personality to play it right in gameplay not necessarily easy 
I've seen a lot of people do really great things, and, I, and half the time it backfires on them, and sometimes the dice are not their friends. So, Ray, you got anything to add? No, you pretty much covered it. We're not going to see any of that go away. Not, not like you know some of the Word of Blake stuff. The uh, the Republic specific designs they're going to stick around and play a part. Um, anything? Any plans for additional stories and content related to the bounty hunter? in this new era. A few times we see them in the novels have all been amazing or at least very thrilling. There's no right. specific yeah, there's no specific plans but the bounty hunter has a current incarnation. He is around and still plays a part in the inner sphere. Um, but we don't have a specific thing. The bounty hunter never played a huge part. He's in the background. Little story here, little story there. And that's what you could probably expect. He is around in the oak land or she. Yeah. Uh, and for what it's worth, uh, like there was an early, one of the first comments was about um, the stories of, of, the, of the, the number of times that the house Krita units are showing up in the recognition guide, stuff like that. Um, uh, please know that a big part of that is because when we looked at the list of dangling plot lines, uh, house Krita had by far the most dangling plot lines that we, you know, that we inherited within three, four years ago. Uh, there were so many things with regard to what they had to do internally to organize the war against the Fed sons um, that the truth is we've only ever been shown the front of the house side of that story. We've never been shown the behind the curtain uh, story of what they had to do internally to pull all those story things going on off. Uh, I believe when John and I sat down and reviewed it, there was it was like two pages of plot lines just regarding House Karita uh, and the Draconis combined. Uh, and so there's a lot of nuance there that ultimately, as those things, I believe we specced them originally for seven or eight novels, and I'm sure that's evolved since uh, as the post Il Clan uh, storylines have been fleshed out further. Uh, but the nuances and stuff that will have that will play out there, I'm sure that the bounty hunter is going to be in there because that's just his or her stomping ground. Um, that's where they they play the puppet master. So, <clears throat> um, okay. Uh, when writing books, oh, when writing books, how finalized are any new designs? I assume it's Mac designs, or maybe it's the book design itself. I'm not sure. Uh -huh. I would assume it's Max. I'm going to assume Science. it's Max. Both. Yeah. <laughs> They're as finalized as you think they would be, and then there's sometimes where we're like, oh, we totally need to change that. That's completely, you throw that out the window and start over. No, I, the mechs don't drive the story, but they're part of the story, and in some ways they're very much character in the stories, depending on, on what you're doing. You know, certain vehicles, I think, like Fratricide, are, are character all on their own, and kind of stand out i when we're working on something big like this you know one of the things that i and i had a side meeting with bren at one point and i said we have to look if we're doing our the wolf at the mechs that are going to be out as part of this and brent did a lot of the initial designs of those mechs and we went back and forth on those so that when it came time for me to insert them i they existed i've seen artwork for them things along those lines. So a lot of these mechs that you guys haven't seen yet um, that are mentioned in Hour of the Wolf, the art's done on them, the designs are done on them. They, they exist. So it, it's kind of a hand and, you know, we, we did that very deliberately. And so it, it was just part of how we did it. All right. Um, who do I talk about spending fan rules and new tech for Battletech? Um, you can uh, email us at store at catalystgamelabs.com and it will get filtered over to Randall that way. Um, he can take a look at it and get in contact with you. Um, next question is, in all seriousness, will there be new clan mechs in the novels? Which novels? Doesn't specify. I'm assuming forthcoming novels and I there's... wouldn't see why there wouldn't be. Yeah, I'm sure the clans are yeah, going to stop making uh, new tech completely and they'll never release a new pack again. <laughs> <laughs> so for the uh, for the poster, if you haven't checked out the recognition guys, they've been coming out um, every other week in in spurts. Uh, check those out. We we have both updated uh, classic designs and completely brand new designs. And 
you'll be seeing those in uh, in the novels. You may even see some in the novels before they appear in the recognition guide, like uh, we had with Hour of the Wolf. But uh, yeah, absolutely, there's going to be new stuff, and there has been new stuff. It's it's ongoing. Um, are we going to see something like the NAIS pop up, or is technology going to stagnate? Yes to the first question, no to the second question. Yeah, I think that's quick and easy. <laughs> uh, will there be any currently planned products covering the who and why behind the blackout? I mean, Stone explained it. Maybe. Stone explained it. What do you need? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. We basically we've answered all of the questions about that in little snippets in every product we've released over the last 15 years. So just buy them all, read them all, and then you'll have the answer. <laughs> Um, what is the status? So, Brent, this is a question for you, actually. What is the status of the minis from Creative Juggernaut? I need to pull up you are right, right now seeing the very first ever preview of the Tukade Configuration Clan Buster Black Knight. That is quite the pose. Yeah, I didn't get mine, Brent. <laughs> Dude, seriously, I expedited it, so it should have showed up yesterday. Yeah, you oh, should. Man. It should have, but it's the United States Postal Service. I know. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure they were just focusing all their attention on delivering votes. Yeah, it's all good. It's all good. So, ta da! Uh, so yeah, the status. We had an unexpected delay. We uh, have been working with the manufacturers of the uh, of the mold making materials. For some reason, the molds are degrading and having a chemical um, composition issue, uh, which is causing us to go through molds five times faster than we should have been. Um, wow. So we, the, the current status is it, they're under production right now. They've been in full production for the last three weeks. Uh, we expect to have them in the very near future uh, and then supply them to uh, Catalyst Game Lab so that they can so fulfill the orders. Um, but right now we're just dealing with the, the nuances of any time you're trying to recreate the wheel. Um, you know, we're building the new production, uh, process, uh, for plastics from scratch and have weird issues show up. So yeah, they're, they're going, I've got my hands on them. Uh, Blaine, apparently I I'm withholding just to mess with him on, on, on things, but I really did mail it, man. I promise. So yeah, those things are coming and they're awesome. Uh, I will say that the Camo Specs team should be. Uh, I think we had seven different members of the Camo Specs team that joined in to do painting on the Black Knights. Theirs should be arriving this upcoming week. So, um, sometime over the next month, you'll be able to see uh, painted versions and, and the, the, the product previews of the Black Knights coming out from Camo Specs. Uh, and I will say that uh, unlike the Storm Crows, which when we sent those out, those were pre production, those were not full production versions. Uh, and they were very clear about it, it saying, you know, these are not quite what we're going to see. These are our early production versions. Uh, but uh, the Black Knights are full production versions. They're, they're coming out great. So, um, yeah, they're, they're not going to make, you know, suddenly fart rainbows or anything. But they're awesome miniatures, and uh, the details came out cool. So, thank you guys yeah. for joining. Yeah, I, I, I second what Brent's saying. That it, you know, the key is to the quality for us and we're trying to make sure we maintain a good level of quality at least at where catalyst is at if not better in terms of the miniatures that were released in the kickstarter um this isn't our end game where we're trying to get to is full-blown plastic injection and we've got a plan to do that um so that's that's where we want to get to just so that there's so many game companies out there that i think are struggling with uh overseas production and it's a challenge and i think a lot of people are willing i think to pay a little bit more to know that they're actually going to get it or that there's better control over it locally so yeah. we'll see how that goes um question about the clan recognition guides recently plush toy for uhu the peregrine win <laughs> Uh, I think the, I think the answer that, to that is uh, let, let us get the other plush out first from the Kickstarter and, may, and maybe if it does yeah. super well we will we will look at other plushes or other um, new ideas that we have for putting different ideas for mechs on the table and not their standard format. 
Um, may we have Battletech comic books, please? Working on that. Yep. Ooh. In fact, you guys are going to be shocked to hear this one. For the, we've had several things come through with the Battletech comic books in the last six weeks. Uh, believe it or not, what we're waiting on at this point is the script for Mike Stackpole. So there's the curveball you weren't expecting. <laughs> John, pressure on you, buddy. Just saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he's got a couple things ahead of that too, but uh, yeah, we're we're yeah, working on it. Uh, I think what was the Solaris Irby Revolt? <laughs> That's a good question myself. I, I'm uh, not, not sure what that is. Right. Uh, it was a little snippet recently. There may be more details on that soon or maybe later. Nothing really to add to it. Sounds like an interesting story, though. Uh, just, just letting you guys know out there in the chat, we are down to the last couple of questions here, and then we're going to wrap up. Some of our guys do need to head out here, so I got about five questions left. Um, and I don't think we're going to take any more questions so that way our guys can get back to, you know, what they do best, which is, you know, working on Battletech and moving, moving the universe forward. So are there certain plot elements of the old MechWare Dark Age era dark novels that you really wish could have been abandoned entirely? Another another tough question. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, well, okay. Ray and I are both grabbing our faces to hold our mouths closed. <laughs> yeah. I, I, Jacob Branson, I, I you know, just never got fully my hands wrapped around that. There, there's a, you know, some of the characters I think got over engineered. Anastasia Krinsky is one of those. I think to a certain degree, her background. When you get into it, if you and, and this is even piecing it together through our source books and stuff, you know she flip flops with what side she's on so much, and you know she changes her name to Tasa K at some point, and it, it really makes a it, it makes her a very difficult character to pick up and run with, and. I personally would have streamlined some of that stuff if I were to retcon it, but we're not going to do that. But um, that was my stuff on my list. How about you, Ray? <laughs> Hopefully the fifth. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, is it where to start kind of thing? <laughs> yeah, though I will say there are some plot lines that are really rough and instead we're going to completely embrace them and run with the consequences instead of pretending <laughs> they don't exist yes and some of you already know what i'm talking about um, um i'll jump in here because there's also a question i wanted to circle back on as one of our five uh i i was i mean and i wasn't really involved with the, the dark age creation and all that stuff but i will say that to me the barrier was one of the biggest issues the Fortress Fortress Republic thing was one of the biggest issues I had just putting up this whole big force fieldy thing because it came out of nowhere in terms of Battletech tech and B, it caused all sorts of issues. Um, there was a question earlier about how Stone was utilized in Hour of the Wolf. And the, the commenter said he claimed, you know, they, they, they thought, in their opinion, that he was kind of wasted compared to what came before. Uh, I'm going to say, and Blaine, that you may have your own thoughts on this as well, it, that was kind of a deliberate choice not, not to waste him. But because we had never told anything from Stone's point of view before, I wanted to go inside his head and show, I mean, A, he was older, and B, he'd been frozen for 15 years, and there were certain aspects of him that I wanted to show that he wasn't quite the, you know, godlike being that he had been kind of made out to be in the Dark Ages, which to me always, you know, we're, uh, this goes back to what we said about uh, Shades of Grey in Battletech. You know, there's, it's very few white hats and very few complete black hats in, in the IP, which is the way I feel you get better stories out of it, other than just a very simplistic good versus evil. Um, and Stone was approached this way throughout the books that he appears in, whether it's um, Rock of the Republic or elsewhere, deliberately, uh, to, to kind of show the interior as, unfortunately, his Republic and everything he fought to, to build kind of starts to fall apart around him because they couldn't keep it together due to outside pressures and interior pressures and forces like that. So it was it was a deliberate choice to portray him this way. So that's 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 my two cents on it for what it's worth. Yeah, and there I, was I, an, 
Go ahead, go ahead, Blaine. Yeah. No, I, I think Stone is is exactly on character. Uh, you know, the fact that some people don't think he's there, it's like, well, I don't know where you're getting your source material from because there wasn't there was only a couple of pieces of fiction. I think Phil wrote some for one of the source books, uh, you know, where he's thawed, which is really one of the very rare times we actually hear Stone actually speak. Um, uh, yeah, it's uh, Jason Smith. That piece. Oh, Schmetzer. Okay. Yeah, it, 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 I knew it was in one of the source books, but it was, you know, when you get down to it, it's like, you know, you may have a differing opinion of how Stone is. You know, every time I talked to John, he had a line that he threw out about Stone. He goes, you just have to remember one thing about Stones. It's always plots and schemes buried within plots and schemes. He's a schemer. Yeah. He's a manipulator. He's a plotter. And, and so that was the key focus for how Stone's strategy, you know, worked. And and also it kind of points to a failing, which I think is important. Stone's strategy was built on hope. It was, I hope Julian Davian's going to show up. I hope the Ghost Bears get my invitation. I hope somebody else who got the invitation will show up. Um, and bail me out because this is go not going the way I wanted it to. And you can't have a strategy for a nation that's built on hope. Hope isn't a viable strategy. And, you know, it, it was great watching all of those various hopes get nipped and chipped and eaten away. And I loved it at the end. I think he got in the final word on Alaric. And, and ultimately, he fired the last shot of the war in, in that conversation yeah. with Alaric. Yeah. There was interesting things with Stone. Most people don't know. I, I was actually brought in by by uh, Jordan to work on Metclix. That's how I entered the pro team, is actually working on in Dark Age. Uh, so I was there when we were discussing the nuances of of what the plot lines were going to be for Stone. And Stone was always, <laughs> believe it or not, Stone was intended to be thawed, be what they called mentally freezer burned, and to become the biggest villain in, in Battletech. Ultimately, it felt incredibly one-dimensional. And, you know, here we are a decade later of me working beyond the stuff that happened in the Dark Age, uh, 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 in the Metclix game and, and nuances. And, and and being a part of the discussions between John and Ray and Randall and Blaine and, and, and all of the author teams and nuances, Jason Schmetzer and, you know, and Phil quietly sitting in the back of the room and occasionally piping in like, yeah, but would that really, you know, there's a lot of things where we had to realize, like process through what's the best way to handle a character as intentionally convoluted as Devlin Stone. Uh, and I know many people know that at one point in time, the end of the battle for Terra was in, was originally going to be a battle between Stone and Alaric, and it was a really interesting point in the in the discussions back and forth of saying, is that even an interesting story? It, it, it it's kind of like saying, you know, do you want to see Ewan McGregor fight my great great grandfather? <laughs> It, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't care how big the stick the great great grandfather's carrying. It, it's just not. Uh, no, dude, he's gonna lose. He's gonna get his ass kicked. And there was just no that way that we could possibly see Stone on a battlefield in a mech fighting Alaric as possibly believable as a threat. Yeah. You just yeah. couldn't swallow it. At this point, correct me if I'm wrong, Phil. He's mm -hmm. what 113 years old. Uh, he's he's over 100. He's yeah, also yeah. been. Uh, he's he's also thought out from imperfect cryogenic technology. Exactly. So he's, a, he's a little freezer as well, and we see yeah. that deterioration throughout *Hour of the Wolf*. Yeah. So <clears> finding <throat> a way for us to craft a story for Stone seeing the Republic fall before his eyes, and him actually living through it. Um, that was one of the most mature and well thought out se series of discussions for crafting the story that I think I've ever seen in Battletech. Um, yeah, the amount um, of times we went over that was amazing. And Stone never accepts responsibility for anything. <laughs> and that was something we established. And, and we established it in Rock of the Republic. Yeah, he, he just doesn't own up to it. He always, even at the end, when people were going... 
put me in a mech. I'll go fight that. I'll go fight the Jade Falcons. I know it's a thousand to one, but I'll go do it because, you know, and he's like, good. They're accepting blame for this. You know, that that stone, he, he totally looks at everyone else as having dropped the ball. You know, he was the one that had a perfect plan. If everyone else had just played to it, it would have worked. Uh, yeah. That's just how he is. Done- Pardon? <laughs> So if you want to, if you want something done right, you got to do it yourself. Yeah. <laughs> um. So last of our qu- four questions: Are we heading for a? Rev- I'm assuming this supposed to say reviving of clans 2.0 between those who accept Alric as ill clan first slash first lord and those who oppose him. <laughs> Just so we're clear, all of the fans should really think about. Like we've spent all this time playing playing characters. We we all had a pretty good idea of what it would be like to be inside the head of a clan character. You can imagine that not everybody's going to go one way or the other. And just like the, the, the rift between the wardens and the crusaders, which evolved over the course of decades, this is going to be something that every single individual warrior at the end of the day looking in the mirror is going to have to face and determine how they're going to walk forward. And I imagine there will probably be some friction. Just put that out there. Well, it's not called peace tech. (laughs) Ray, Ray, I think Ray has given more thought to this particular component of it than just about anybody on the team. Do you have any thoughts you want to share, Ray? Uh, Without getting deep into it, obviously giving stuff away something i said earlier is that after reading hour of the wolf people see a straight line from here and how everything is going to fall lockstep into place (laughs) (laughs) but it should be exactly it should be interesting and exciting yeah a straight line. Have you guys does ever seen Wipeout? Out? You see the dude take like a two or three step run toward the obje- the obstacle, and that's what you're seeing right now. This is the two to three steps. Is that's how far your straight line storyline is going to go mm-hmm. before you hit the big red balls? Um, no one for Ray. Besides the time, uh, besides time of war, will more RPG elements says to the game instead of the board game, but more on the role playing game. Um, there has been some discussion there. Um, there's nothing definite about what we're going to do other than we're going to keep supporting um, both Time of War and Mech War Destiny in our upcoming source books. In fact, we were <laughs> talking about it just yesterday. Um, I can't get into any specific RPG specific products, but uh, yes, we will keep supporting them. Uh, a Time of War is currently being looked at for a, a revised edition. Um, I could say that. But, uh, yeah, we have the RPG in mind moving forward. RPGs. Um, are there any plans to expand upon the deep periphery with the Ill Clan era? There are discussions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, discussions, yeah. But, I mean, here's the thing to keep in mind about them and even more so the home clans. It's called Periphery for a reason. It's some cool stuff on the outside of everything that is important. It is literally peripheral to all the storylines. Yeah. Um, And then the last one... Oh, go ahead, Brett. Yeah, one of the most interesting things there, you really have have to think about it. For those of us that have been longtime fans and have read the lore, we have a, a, a grasp of the just how many planets were colonized and built, established oh. everything beyond what we now currently know of as the inner sphere. There are so many planets out there. And just like everything else, it comes down to where is the most interesting story? Why is that a story? And as you can imagine, in a time where the ill clan decide that they now are here to rule and conquer humanity, uh, knowing that there's planets out there that have been built, that have infrastructure that was abandoned, that knowing that they're just basically out there unconnected to everything else because jump, jump ships stopped going to that system. Knowing that that's a possibility 
for everybody that's creating their own stories and their own campaigns and, and looking for places to be where they won't be directly under the guns of some major house or another, um, there is a lot in the periphery where interesting stories can be told. We just need to explore those. Yep. It's a uh, big universe. Like the Raven Alliance. Yeah, that's funny, yeah, Chris. And then, By uh, the way, the someone also mentioned earlier, real quick, Talon, someone mentioned about right. anything for Clan Hell's Horses. Yes. That's all I'm going to say. Yes. There you go. Okay, and the last one was the Tank Crew storyline was great. Will we also see something like that with a Quad V Crew? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes, the Tank storyline was great. Maybe someone's going to write it. <laughs> There you go. Just wrap up. What do you uh, What do you say, Blaine? Have those guys uh, wind up with the Hell's Horses? No. God no. no. <laughs> those guys. <laughs> I can't I've been trying to come up with a good story yet. for them. I, I haven't come up with what one just yet. It's got to be right for those guys. Those guys are my favorite characters out of our the Wolf. And... Um, fighting the Hell's Horses. Yes. Fighting the Hell's Horses might be fun, but yeah, they they they're very interesting. They're, they're an interesting pair, and um, it's hard to recapture that magic with somebody else. Yeah. Uh, and, and I know we were going to take more questions, but I'll take one more just because it's a really good question. What's the best way to keep up to date with new releases? Uh, I'll make that the last one because it's a pretty good question, especially uh, from our official side. Our, uh, our Facebook page is probably the best if you... Uh... If you like like our page, our announcements go out there. But then you can catch us on uh, on Twitter. Our announcements go out there as well. Uh, we get uh, we post everything to the forum. So any of those three places, the official forum, our official BattleTech Twitter, or our Facebook page, um, all the announcements go through those three channels. Okay, and that was our last question that I kind of pulled kind of at the the last minute because i thought it was a really good answer for for us um ray i know that this is not the uh the last ama we are doing do you want to talk a little bit more about what's what's coming ahead for amas because some people did ask if more were coming up uh yeah give me a second i'll go ahead and pull that up If anyone who didn't hear from the previous day. ones, real quick while he's doing that, uh, Shrapnel has been cleared for year two, so we'll have at least through eight, and I fully expect it to go on beyond that. So thank Yay. you guys for your support. I really appreciate you guys coming out and supporting those. Phil's done heroic work putting those together, um, and we've got you know great game work, uh, game nonfiction, fiction work, all that stuff. We want to put more art in there. We want to put some. I want to start getting ads in there. We need to get some more in universe ads. I think it would be really cool. We got to start working on that with Dak and other people. But yeah. Going strong, and thanks to you guys for, for supporting it. We couldn't do it without you. That was really yeah, Tra great. Travel's been going real strong. We've been really enjoying what's coming out of it. Yeah. yeah, it is. It's a great forum. And what I like is we're getting some new writers. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Great to break ground with new folks. Absolutely. Yeah. And a uh, quick plug yeah, in, you know, you want you want to try and throw something in for Shrapnel, just get a hold of John. Ah, uh, Phil. Get a hold or of Phil. Phil. Get a hold of me. <laughs> Phil's amazing. Yeah, I will say, like, the, yeah, the easiest way to get it. I say I've been pretty impressed with uh, some uh, some of the stuff I've seen coming in from just from new people, so mm -hmm. it's pretty, pretty exciting. Yep. And what were you saying? Were you saying something, Brent? I was saying that the easiest way to get up to date on all of the new releases is to convince John and and Phil to that you, that you can write stories for BattleTech and write a bunch of stories for BattleTech, and then John will just mail you all the new releases as they come out. It's awesome. They just show us <laughs> up as if by magic. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god you lie so horribly <laughs> it's yeah, funny because stuff will come out and you're like oh is that coming out this week yeah it is I mean, <laughs> did I'm still waiting for the mail yet, story so. it's not entire, <laughs> <not> entirely wrong <laughs> burn with all of his yeah, shrapnel now oh jeez uh, Ray, I think it was coming back there, right? Yeah. Uh, so there you go. the uh, let's see, our next Ray AMA is a, uh, an hour of the. <laughs> oh my! Am, am I on here? What's up? Yeah, you're, oh, you're, you're go, go, go ahead. ahead. Go, go ahead, ahead, Ray. They were showing okay. off swag. Something's breaking up here. So oh, uh, March twentieth, uh, two p.m. Eastern. That's eleven a.m. Pacific. 
we're going to have an AMA on writing for Battletech. So we're going to have uh, John Helfers again, Phil uh, Lee here. Um, Aaron will be on there. Uh, we should also have Randall Bills, uh, Jason Smetzer, and Jeff Swift. And that's March 20th, again, same time as this one. Uh, then in April 24th, uh, again, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, we're going to have an AMA on the recognition guides. So a lot of the questions that came up today, you'll be able to ask uh, some of the guys directly. Johannes Hedler is the main developer for the recognition guides, and we'll have some of the writers, uh, Chris Wheeler, Jonathan, Joshua Franklin, Keith Hahn, and Lance Skarinci uh, will be joining us then. In uh, May, we're also planning on doing one for Battletech Art. Uh, we don't have all the details of who and what and when. Brent will obviously be there leading the way, um, and that will be in May. Those are the next ones we have scheduled, uh, and they <laughs> were posted to the you know to all the usual places, and we'll post them again uh, when we do the. Uh... So it's, so it's about once a month. Uh, once a month is what we're trying to do. We'll see how they go. Yeah. So, well, there you have it, guys. I know I saw a couple of questions on if there are going to be more AMAs. So it's going to be about once a month. Ray's got a, a nice plan sh sh uh, showing up for those who are interested in those topics. So remember, guys, to uh, subscribe to the Catalyst YouTube channel, and you'll be able to get prep notices for when we are about to go live. We'll try and always set the video live times, you know, in a way that you guys can get the, the ping. So subscribe, hit the bell icon. Leave a like, comment below on all videos. We'll be happy to answer them for any, you know, potentially hopefully leftover questions as we, uh, as the video gets posted up onto YouTube of this AMA. Uh, thank you guys so much for being here. We could not do this without you. And we're, we love seeing the support that the AMAs are getting and, the, and being able to answer your questions in a more uh, direct and thorough manner that we wouldn't normally be able to do out on social media because there's just usually so many of them. So anything else that the, the team here wants to say before we uh, wrap up? Thank you all for supporting Battletech. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. You're welcome. Keep reading, keep playing. There you go. Best keep, fans in the world. Keep reading, keep playing. Have a good day, guys. Great seeing you, and we will see you guys in the next AMA. Ray Wynn? Uh, that should be the 20th. The 20th of next month. So okay. see you guys there. You'll see another live stream pop up for those of you who are subscribed and have the bell icon ring. So have a great day, guys. Bye, everybody. See ya. Thanks, everyone. Bye. See ya.